When I was about seven or eight, I had a disturbing encounter with some kind of creature or, or entity. I lived in the Appalachian mountain range of Pennsylvania. It was November, around when daylight saving time occurred. I remember it was supposed to be a school day, but since the snow was so heavy, the buses were not able to drive out in the morning, so school was canceled for a snow day. I was so excited to spend the rest of the day outside in the snow. We had an acre of property going quite far back into the woods. I was walking deep into the forest to a small frozen pond past my property line. All of a sudden the woods went dead silent. No birds, no wildlife scurrying around. Absolutely nothing. I remember thinking it was strange, but kept walking to make it to the pond. I should have turned around right then and there, but was just a naive little kid. After I reached the pond, everything was still completely silent, and the hairs on the back of my neck felt like they were rising. I started to get frightened, but I didn't know why. I felt like something really bad was going to happen to me if I didn't leave at that moment, so I decided to run back home. As I arrived to my backyard, I realized it was so late, and the sun was actually setting. My mom came running outside asking where I was literally all day, and to never, ever disappear like that ever again. None of this made sense to me, because I had only been outside for about twenty minutes. I left my house with my snow gear on at around ten, zero a.m. right after getting the snow day call. It was now almost eight, zero p.m., meaning I had been gone for around ten hours. I have no idea what happened and how I had been gone for such a long period of time. I remember only being out there for such a short period of time. I don't know if this was a skinwalker encounter or even a wendigo encounter. Has anyone else had this happen to them? Was it some kind of creature? I didn't see anything at all while out there. I didn't lose track of time, and I didn't fall and hit my head or anything. What do you think happened? Please let me know in the comments. Each year, me and one of my closest friends, who we will call Dane, go down to visit his grandparents at their cabin in a nice, small, peaceful town in the North Georgia mountains. Me, my friend, and his grandpa are all outdoors, kind of people, so we are always looking for something fun for all of us to do around the area. One night, we decided to go explore some trails not too far from the cabin. Now, these aren't the kind of trails you're probably thinking of. They really are more a gravel dirt road, but a lot of hunters, campers, motorbikers, and backpackers use it. We headed out to the trail, and right as we pulled up to the trail, we were gonna go on. We noticed an older, beat-up, suspicious-looking black Chevy Savvy with two middle-aged men in it parked next to the entrance of the trail. Now, even though this is a safe area, drug deals and other kinds of sketchy activity can occur deep in these woods, so we avoided going on that trail and decided to head down to another trail about a half a mile down the road. We pulled about fifty or so feet into the trail just outside of view from the road, parked the truck, and got out and started our exploration. Our little night hike was off to a great start until we got about a mile in. We started to hear a dog bark from probably about three hundred feet away. We decided to keep going, but the dog just would not stop barking, and we didn't know if the dog was on a leash or not and could come attack us, so we decided to turn around and head back. Looking back, I'm really happy we turned around when we did. When we were about, I would say, 1,000 or so feet away from the truck, we could see a car sitting behind my friend's grandpa's truck, running with its headlights on. This instantly made us worried, because who would just roll up behind a random truck at ten, zero at night, on an isolated trail, and keep in mind, you would have had to drive into the trail to see where we parked the truck. It was not visible from the road. We stood there for about five minutes, trying to see if we could see anybody, but since it was so dark and pretty far away, it was hard to see anything. Fortunately for us, there was a pretty large tree next to the trail we were able to stand behind, so there was no way they could see us from where they were parked. My friend's grandpa took these night vision binoculars we had with us to try and get a better look, but it was still not much help. We decided to just stand there and wait for them to turn around and leave, 
because there was no chance we were going to walk back with this random car with potential bad people in it sitting behind our truck. After about ten minutes of just standing there, to my absolute horror, the car drives around the truck and starts to head down the trail in our direction. As fast as we could, we climbed up this hill right next to us and hid behind a log that was sitting up on the top. A few seconds later, the same beat-up black Chevy sub we saw outside the other trail we were originally supposed to hike on comes driving down where we were just standing, not even fifteen seconds ago. The car had its windows rolled down and started to slow down as it drove past us. Me, my friend, and Grandpa were terrified. Our hearts were pounding out of our chests, and we were scared these guys would stop and sit there or even worse, get out and start looking for us. Fortunately, the car just kept driving and never stopped. As soon as the car was out of sight, we got out of our hiding spot, booked it back to the truck, and got the hell out of there. I know this may not be as scary as some others, but to us, it was definitely pretty frightening. We don't know who or what those guys wanted. My guess is they had a stash on that trail deeper in the woods and thought we stumbled upon it or something and were out there to confront us, or even worse. A lot of things could have gone wrong. We could have walked up to the truck just as they pulled in. What if they came out and looked for us? What if they slashed the tires to the truck? Or what if they turned their headlights off and sat there and waited for us to come back? My friend and his grandpa actually went back in the daytime a few days later to the exact spot where we were hiding and took some pictures posted below. The first picture is where we were standing looking at the truck and car behind it. Off in the distance you can see our truck parked. That's exactly where we had it parked that same night. Just off to the left is the hill we rushed up to hide from the car. In the second picture, you can see where our hiding spot was after my friend and his grandpa went back. They said we were very lucky to have made it up there successfully, as it seemed impossible to do it as fast as we did, especially with all the shrubs and thorns in the way. If we got up there just even two seconds later, we would have been seen. I can only imagine what could have happened if we didn't make it up that hill and those guys saw us. I used to work for the Chickat County Sheriff back in the mid-90s. Chickat really is the ass end of nowhere, the poorest place in the entire state of Arkansas. Back when I was a deputy, there were never more than about 10,000 people in the entire county. It was and still is the kind of place that people drive through without a second thought. But I think about Chickat a whole lot. I, I think about it every day. Sometimes it's all I can think about, no matter how much booze I sink or how many pills I take. Back in the fall of 96, Chickat started to become flooded with a kind of low-grade crystal methamphetamine that we call cranks or biker meth. High-grade meth forms crystals, hence the name, but the low-quality stuff is just a powdery white substance that can burn up the user's throat because of the crap it's cut with. We were finding that junk everywhere. It was decimating the poor folks out there. It was in the schools, in the bars, even in the churches. We arrested this one kid who, who'd been awake all weekend and had sat there twitching in the pews until the collection plate came around. Didn't even care that people saw him take the money either and was too messed up to even have any means of a getaway. Violent crime skyrocketed in the space of about four months. Things were getting out of control. We were picking up tweakers from all over that were making pilgrimages to check out just to spend their money on the cheapest, dirtiest crystal we at the department had ever seen. I put cuffs on guys from Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, even as far away as Indiana. The county sheriff even got a call from the governor who demanded something be done about it all, and as you can imagine, all that fecal matter rolled straight downhill. But we had no idea where this stuff was coming from. Anyone we picked up for selling wouldn't talk about who they got it from, no matter what we threatened them with. They were like crystal commandos. And from my experience, that's just not like tweakers to cover for each other. They'll do anything to stay out of jail because it usually means a forced detox.
But these dealers, they kept their mouths shut like they were full-blooded mafia, La Crystal Nostra or something, like they were more scared of the guys selling it to them than they were of us. We bagged one guy with six pounds of the stuff, and it was me that drove him over to the county for booking. Afterward, I went back to my car, and there was all this mud just caked onto the floor under the back seats of my cruiser. I mean, it was everywhere. It smelled real bad, and I was pissed that he'd made such a goddamn mess. But then it hit me. All that mud had to have come from somewhere, right? And by the looks of things, we'd managed to bag the guy just as he'd gotten a re-up from his connection. So wherever this guy had just come from was muddy, real muddy, like maybe somewhere out near the Mississippi, or one of the lakes there are in Chicot. I decided to take drive just to see what I could see. Maybe a little walk, too, if the feeling took me. Besides, what was the worst that could happen? I found our crystal cooks and brought them in for the big win. Well, as it turns out, that actually was the worst thing that could happen, and afterwards I'd never be the same again. I spent a lot of time fishing with my pa when I was a kid. It's pretty much all there was to do in Chicka, a county of over 40 separate lakes and reservoirs, and I'd been to almost all of them. Most of the shorelines are shale or sandy soil, but one particular shoreline is pure mud, one you're going to lose your shoes in if you don't have the foresight to wear rubber boots, and it has the infinitely creative but descriptive name of Mud Lake. And it was Mud Lake that I decided to take drive to that afternoon. The lake itself isn't too popular with fishermen, not unless you're looking for some monster catfish, and those things can be much more trouble than they're worth to reel in. So as I'm tracing the edges of it on foot, I thought it pretty strange to see a trail of smoke wafting up through some trees around the other side. I mean, it was faint, real faint, and maybe if the wind had been blowing just a little, I'd have never even seen it at all. But it was eerily still that day and just as quiet. It took me about 20 to 30 minutes of walking, but I traced the edge of the lake right around to the rough area I could see the smoke. The closer I got to the source, the more I began to smell this disgusting putrid stench, almost like a mix of rotten eggs and cat piss. I also noticed that patches of what would have otherwise been healthy plant life had started to die, like whatever I was closing in on was death itself, how no life could survive near it. I thought about turning back a few times, but eventually came across what I can only describe as a series of wood panel and corrugated iron shacks. I knew I should call out to see if anyone was home, or announced myself as a deputy and demand that whoever was inside should come out, but the feeling of dread in the pit on my stomach just seemed to stop any words from coming out of my mouth. Cops don't go by the book all the time, especially not small-town deputies like me. Besides, I couldn't hear anything coming from inside any of the shacks. And aside from the small campfire burning in a clearing between the shacks, there were little signs of human inhabitancy. I pushed open the door to one of the shacks with my forty-four drawn and immediately recoiled at the fumes that came out. I'd never actually seen a working meth lab before, but I didn't need any narcotics expert to tell me. That's exactly what I'd just seen. There was all kinds of trash strewn around in there. Discarded packaging from cold medicine, batteries that had been cut open, used coffee filters, and that wasn't including all the improved glassware set up on a small table. That, and I'd heard stories about how bad they smelled from all the chemicals being mixed up in them, which must have been where that cat piss smell was coming from. I backed off from the shack, coughing and spluttering, feeling nauseous with my eyes streaming. I felt awful, but at the same time kind of elated. I was almost certain I'd found our meth cook. It was only when I searched the other shacks that I began to really freak out. The first one was evidently some kind of sleeping area, with two camping cots set up on either side of the shack. Only the thing was, they didn't look used at all. They were covered in the same kind of trash that was strewn about the lab. Shack gas canisters, tubs of what looked like raw chemical ingredients. Whoever used those shacks obviously didn't sleep much, if at all. There was also rolls of dollar bills all over the place. 
These guys weren't taking care of their profits at all, it seemed. Either they were making too much money to account for it all, or money just didn't matter to them, and that was a terrifying prospect to me. Whoever was flooding Chicket with Crank wasn't doing it for the cash. They were doing it for some other reason entirely. But it was the things that were written on the wood wall panels that really got my attention. All kinds of weird phrases and symbols had been scrawled on the walls and what appeared to be black marker pen, stuff in chicken scratch handwriting so bad I could barely make any of the words out that was interspersed with skulls. Devil-looking things and little black stars. I backed out of this second shack and went to check on the third, which was by far the worst one of all. There was another rotten smell coming from behind a flimsy wooden door, but this one was from something very different to a meth lab, and when I peeked inside I almost puked from how bad it was. Surrounded by yet more piles of trash and money was a big old wooden stake that looked like it had been driven into the ground as deep as it had possibly go. And tied to that wooden stake was the most mutilated dead body I'd ever seen in all my years of police work. Whoever it was had been dead for a while, but they hadn't completely decomposed yet, and there were so many flying insects and maggots crawling over their face and body that at first it kind of looked like they were moving. I'm not sure how much the damage had been inflicted while they were still alive, and I pray that most of the mutilation had been done post-mortem. But the look of agony of the corpse's face makes that almost impossible to imagine. The poor soul tied to that stake that had been scalped, had one of their eyes removed, had teeth pulled, fingers cut off with the stumps, looking like they'd been cauterized to stop them from bleeding too much. There were deep, dark-looking patterns of cuts around their face that suggested they'd been carved up in a kind of ritualistic way while they were still alive. The same kind of black burn marks on their finger stumps were present on the torso and thighs, too, looking almost like cigarette burns, but like they'd been inflicted by something bigger. There were many other wounds on the body that would require a coroner to really be able to tell how they were inflicted. But one thing was clear to me, whoever this was had been tortured, maybe even to death. Then right as I'm about to turn around to head back to my cruiser and radio the whole thing in, I hear something moving through the trees behind me. I spin around to see the filthiest son of a bitch I'd ever seen, just walking through the trees in nothing but boots, a pair of piss-stained white briefs, a shin holster with what looked like a hunting knife tucked into it, and a gas mark. He had some kind of a variant slung over his shoulder, too, but luckily I had my forty-four trained on him before he could react and reach for it. I told him not to move or I'd put him down, and at first he starts raising his hands nice and slow. All I could see of his face was the cold, dead gaze that stared back at me through the misty, clear plastic eye, holes of his gas mask. There was just nothing behind them, like they were a doll's eyes or something, alive but not alive. Then I heard something moving behind me, and I figured it might have been his partner or whoever the second camping cot belonged to, and for just a second I was dumb enough to give this guy my back out of fear his partner was trying to sneak up on me. But it must have been a possum or something running through the woods because there was nothing there when I turned, and by the time I looked back, the guy in the gas mask was unshouldering his rifle and prepping to fire. I let off three shots at him, and I'm pretty sure I missed everyone. In return, he lets off an automatic burst of rifle fire that ripped up the shacks behind me, and somehow, either from the poor vision of his mask or the recoil of the rifle, he managed to miss me too. Next thing I know, I'm running through the trees, trying to use the trunks for cover in between looking for a solid position to return fire. I can hear this guy barking like a rabid dog while he chases me, and I fire three more shots in a running gun battle that leaves my forty four empty. He replies with another burst of rifle fire, and although it didn't feel like I'd been hit right away, I suddenly found I wasn't able to run anymore like I suddenly lost all feeling in my right shin. 
I hear him make this muted whooping sound, like he must have seen me go down and realize one of his shots had hit the mark. But from the lack of follow-up fire, I figured he too must be out of ammo. I didn't see any spare magazines on him. He was half-naked after all, but he did have that knife on him, and I could hear him hollering about how he was going to use it on me as he took off after me through the trees. The whole time I'm reloading my 44, I'm thinking about the state of the body back there in the third shack, how no one but me knew I was out there, how he'd have all the time in the world to work me over, just as I'm assuming he'd done to that poor son of a bitch tied to the stake. That was the most afraid I'd ever been in my entire life. Every single other emotion pales in comparison to the intensity of that fear. I was shaking so bad I could barely load my revolver. Even with the speed loader, I could barely manage it. But somehow I did, rolling onto my back and aiming just in time to see that sick bastard coming through the trees at me with his knife in his hand. I put all six bullets into him, and then watched him collapse into him, and then watched him collapse into the dirt, like a sack full of rocks. It wasn't over, though. I still had to crawl back through the mud and the blood to my cruiser, and I had to snake past the cook's dead body in order to do so. The whole time I'm crawling past him. I was expecting his eyes to just open up suddenly, like a horror movie or something, for him to roll onto my back and plunge that hunting knife into my neck while I was trying to crawl away. Every second was drawn out, my heart racing as I tried to keep one eye on the guy and one eye ahead of me. But he didn't wake up, no one just gets up after taking sense of forty, four slugs to the chest. I was retired on medical grounds not long after. Doctors said the bullet that hit me fractured when it hit the shin bone, and there's been a piece of lead still stuck in my right leg ever since, meaning I now walk with a permanent limp. But that's just the physical scarring of what I went through that day. Sometimes I think the mental after effects have been far worse. I barely slept a wink for months, and if I actually did manage to drift off after drinking myself into a stupor, the nightmares would be enough to have me waking up screaming, having soaked the bed sheets with cold sweat. It got so bad that my wife couldn't sleep in the same bed as me until hours upon hours of therapy sessions gave me some small measure of closure. I thought for a while she might divorce me, because the man that came back from Mud Lake just wasn't the same as the one that drove out there. I'm doing much better now. Me and the wife are still together, and we live down in Florida quite comfortably, too, thanks to the compensation I got from the government. I got a Medal of Valor from them, too, something most guy would keep on display somewhere. But I keep that thing locked away in a drawer. My therapist recommended I write something like this to help process what happened back at Mud Lake, thinking that it might help me get past it. I told him I'd rather just forget but I know that's not possible, that the memories of Mud Lake will stay with me until I'm as dead as the cook in his gas mask. Have you ever felt a strong presence from the woods, a feeling like you're being watched? Well, the truth is something is watching you from the trees and shadows. Monsters hide in the woods, preying on the innocent and striking quickly. They won't stop. They never will. This my story, and I hope it serves as a warning to all about the truth of the woods and how dangerous it truly is. How dangerous it truly is. How dangerous they are. Growing up, I never had a dad. My father left me and my mom when I was young, and I haven't seen him since. Sure, I get the occasional birthday or Christmas card with money, but besides that, he's almost a stranger to me. After my father left, my mother decided to leave the city life behind, and we moved when I was ten to Wisconsin, where we bought a small cabin out in the woods. At first, I hated living there. The woods always terrified me as a kid. Every time I looked out the window towards the woods, I always got an unsettling feeling. Chills would run up my spine, and I would start to shake uncontrollably. I always felt something was watching me. The feeling never went away, even as I got older. I hated to walk to school I had to make every day. The looming feeling of getting watched grew even stronger as I walked in the woods. 
I felt so vulnerable looking at the tall trees. The woods I lived by had almost an endless stretch of tall trees in the forest. I felt something was watching me up on the trees. My mom, though, felt completely different about the woods. She loved them. She loved taking walks outside and just staring at the trees in the forest, taking all of nature in. She was an artist, so she loved to just sit outside and paint the trees. Many of the portraits in our cabin were of the trees in the forest. I asked her if she ever felt a presence when she was out there, like something watching her. Yes, I feel a strong presence, but it's a comforting one, she said. I feel safe and protected. I never understood why she had such a conforming feeling from the woods while I felt a terrifying one, one that kept wide awake almost every night. On one night, when I was about to go to sleep, I saw something from the trees. It was far off into the distance, but I could barely make out the silhouette of a figure. It was big and bulky with long arms, and from the angle, it looked like it was staring right at me. I froze as I started at it, then I heard my mom walking to my room, and when I turned to see her open the door, I looked back to see the figure gone. I tried telling my mom, but she never listened. She said I was simply imagining things, and that I needed to quit being scared of the woods. The woods protect us from the outside world, Michael. They are a shield to all the bad things in the world. I knew what I saw, and I knew what I saw, and I knew whatever it was wasn't protecting me. On the way to school that morning, I felt the presence stronger than ever. Every time I turned around, though, nothing was there. Suddenly, I heard a branch snap behind me, and I didn't dare turn around. I couldn't move. Then I heard another branch snap, and I took off running. I could hear fast steps behind me as I was running, which made me run faster. I could hear the footsteps gaining on me. When it seemed they were right on me, I burst out of the woods, sweating like a pig. The day went by normal. Once school was over, I asked my friend James if he wanted to walk home with me. James was my best friend and the only person who understood my fear of the woods. He lived close by to me, and he also could feel a disturbing presence watching him. He tried telling his parents like I did with mine, but they didn't listen either. Dude, did that really happen? He asked as I told him about what happened on the walk to school. Yeah, man. I just don't feel comfortable walking in those woods alone, man. I know there's something in there. I said, what do you think it is? James asked as we started walking home. I don't know. I think I saw it last night, though. It was like really big with huge long arms. It was far away, so I couldn't see anything else. He was quiet now. Then he said, I think I've seen it, too. I saw something last night, too. It was a lot like the thing you described. Then we heard a loud snap behind us and turned around to see a tree branch on the ground snapped in half. Dude, something's following us. We need to run, James said. No, don't run. I did that and it chased me. Maybe if we keep walking slowly, it won't do anything. James, looking terrified at me, James, looking terrified at me, nodded his head slowly as we started walking. We heard more snaps as we walked, getting louder and closer as we walked. I looked over at James. He looked back at me white as a ghost. After what felt like an hour, I could see the outline of my house in the distance. Our pace quickened as we got closer and closer to my house. The snaps and cracks quickening as well behind us. As soon as we got close enough, we took off in a dead sprint towards my house, not looking back. We ran inside and I locked the door once we were inside. Everything okay? I heard my mom say behind me. We looked at each other, then I heard James say, Yeah, Mrs. S. We just raced each other to the house. She looked at me and I nodded quickly. Okay. Be careful, though, with the door. It's old and I don't want it falling off. Okay, sorry, Mom, I said as James started to run off upstairs. Once upstairs and in my room, James said, Dude, we can't walk that way to school. I know, but what will we tell our parents? They won't believe us, I said. James was silent now. I knew he wouldn't be able to come up with anything. I think as long as we're quiet and walk slow, that thing won't come after us, I said. Yeah, let's hope so, James said in a quivering voice. 
James went home shortly after that, and after I ate dinner, I headed upstairs to bed. What is that thing, I think, as I laid in bed? A person, an animal. It's fast like an animal, but it looks like a tall person. I looked out the window into the dark forest and froze. The thing was there and closer. I could make out more characteristics as I stared at it. It had a hunchback and long fingers with razor-sharp claws. I didn't see any eyes on it, but I could somehow feel its cold stare locked on me. It just stared, observing me. Then it turned around and walked back into the forest. That is no person or animal, I think to myself, once it's gone. It wants me. I'm its prey. After a restless night of sleep, I woke up and walked downstairs to see my mom sitting on the counter with a worried look on her face. Hey, Mom, everything okay? I asked. Morning, honey, I have some bad news. She said, look at me. What is it? I asked. Your friend James. Well, he's missing. His parents went into his room this morning and he was gone. I stood there petrified. It wasn't following us. It was tracking us, tracking James. Are you okay, Michael? she asked. I could only see James' face in my mind now. The image of him looking at me as we were walking home, white as a ghost. I couldn't keep everything in, and I told my mom everything. The thing that chased me, me and James being stalked by it, and seeing it for the past two nights getting closer to me. You've got to believe me, Mom, I pleaded. Something is in those woods, and it took James, and now I think it's going to take me. She looked at me with a sad expression. She sighed, then said, I know this must be hard for you, Michael, but there's nothing in those woods. James might have ran away or anything could have happened. Mom, it took him. James would never run away from his parents, I said. Looked at me then. Look at the clock behind me. Uh, I think it's time you get to school now, dear. We'll talk about this later. I pleaded with my mom to drive me to school, begged her on my knees. She finally relented after a minute. Okay, just this one time. We need to leave now, though, and be quick. I have to get to the studio. I thanked her and ran to get my backpack and stuff. Nothing happened on the drive as I expected. After dropping me off at the front of the school, everyone ran up to me and asked if I heard about what happened to James. Everyone was talking about James that day. They started rumors either saying he ran away or was kidnapped. Do you know what happened to him, Sally? Asked frantically as she ran up to me at lunch. She had had a crush on James since the second grade, and even though James showed no signs since the second grade, and even though James showed no signs all. Affection towards her, she still adored him. She was a short girl with short brown hair and brown eyes. I debated about whether I should tell Sally the truth, but I knew she wouldn't believe me. No one would. I told her I didn't know and tried to continue eating my lunch, but she wouldn't give up. Come on, Michael. You're his best friend. Please, if you know anything that could have happened to him, please tell me, she said with tears in her eyes. I tried ignoring her, but she wouldn't stop. Then her friends came over and started asking. Then more and more people came asking if I knew what happened to James. The voices became too much for me, and I screamed. I don't know what happened to him. Please leave me alone. I screamed as loud as I could. Everyone stopped talking and now stared at me. My cheeks started to turn red as I got embarrassed. The bell rang and everyone started heading off to class, leaving me still sitting at the lunch table. I packed my unfinished lunch and started to head off to my science class, which I had next. I decided then and there that I would find James. I had to know if he was alive or not. James, if you're still alive, I'll find you. After school, I called my mom and asked if she could pick me up. She said she could, and five minutes later, she pulled up in her white Cadillac. As we drove home, she asked, feeling better, honey. I lied, saying much better. I knew she would never believe me. I lied, saying much better. I knew she would never believe me. I was going to have to face that thing on my own. We got home, and I headed straight upstairs where I dumped all my school supplies on my bed and started to pack gear for that night. I packed spare flashlight batteries, some water, and I put the pepper spray my mom gave to me last year in my pocket just in case. As I was eating dinner, I came up with a plan. 
I would sneak out of the house when my mom went to bed, which was usually around 10, and I would head into the woods and try to find a look for James. I knew my chances against that thing were slim to none, so I knew I would have to be quiet and careful. After dinner, I went to my room and waited. I waited for hours until I looked over at my clock, which read 10.30 p.m. I hopped out of bed and walked over to the window, opening it quietly. I made a little rope with my bed sheets as I waited as I knew I wouldn't be able to jump off the window without getting hurt. I tied the rope against my bed and started to climb out of the house slowly. Once down, I turned my flashlight on and aimed it towards the woods. It was even more terrifying now. The trees seemed endless and I couldn't even see the moon. I took a deep breath and started to walk slowly into the woods. I noticed something that started to scare me quickly once I was walking. There was absolute silence. Not a peep, no crickets, no owls, nothing. I flashed my light around quickly, calling out James' name quietly. James, James, are you out there? Nothing but silence echoes the woods. I walked towards the directions of James' house, thinking he may be around there. As I'm about halfway to his house, the battery for my flashlight dies. Darkness now engulfs me as I panic. I scramble for the batteries in my backpack. Once I find them, I take the dead batteries out of my flashlight and put the new ones in. When I turned my light back on, I screamed. Standing in front of me was that thing. The fear I felt was indescribable. Even to this day, the image of it still fills my dreams with nightmares. It had no skin. It was all red muscles and tissues. It had no eyes, and its mouth was full of dozens of razor-sharp teeth as it smiled and drooled, looking down at me. It was at least nine feet tall, and it had a bad hunch to its back. Its claws were even sharper close up. Its claws were even sharper close up, as sharp as its teeth were. Its upper body was big and bulky, while its long legs were skinny as a twig. Its arms were huge, with big muscles and bulging veins. I screamed even more as it bent down and picked me up by the head. It dragged me across the woods as I kicked and screamed. Stupid, 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 stupid. What the hell were you thinking coming into the woods, I thought. It dragged me until I eventually passed out. When I woke, I found myself in a dark cave hanging upside down by at least five feet. The cave looked ancient with three tunnels that led into darkness. I had never seen this cave in the woods never even knew there was one in the first place. The light that was in the cave was from a single fire in the middle of the cave. I could see my backpack on the ground with my phone near it. I tried to reach and grab it, but I couldn't move. The thing had wrapped ropes around my angles to the sharp rocks above me. I was hopeless. I thought to James now as I started to look around the cave. In one of the corners of the caves, I saw a single orange t-shirt on the ground. That's James's shirt, I realized. Suddenly I heard heavy footsteps walking towards me. I saw the thing walk into the cave as it stared at me. I panicked and started screaming again. Then the thing spoke in a dark and gruff voice, quiet food. Maybe I'll let you live a little longer. I shut up now, petrified as it spoke to me. I saw in its hand a leg. Oh God, please let that not be James, I thought. It spoke again now. I've been watching you for a long time. You have always looked the most appetizing of everyone. It lifted up the leg in its hand, then said, Your friend here tasted wonderful, but I think you'll taste it wonderful. But I think you'll taste even better, it said with a twisted grin on its face. I started to cry, weeping at the loss of my friend and knowing that I would follow in his footsteps. Somehow I got out a question in a shaky voice. What are you? The thing. Looked it down at me for a moment, thinking, then said, I am an ancient being. My kind is almost extinct, as there are only a few of us left. We have ruled the woods for the past centuries, preying on anything that steps foot on any of our lands. Over time, hunters have come and killed most of my kind. Now we hide in the shadows, only coming out when food is near. I think for a moment before asking another question. Do you only eat young kids? The thing now smiled, showing off its dozen of teeth, as it said. Of course, kids taste the best, very juicy and sweet. It had cut me off the ropes with its claws.
squeezing me with its ginormous hands as it started to open its mouth. I was barely able to ask one more question. How can you hunt without any eyes? It stared at me, closing its mouth before saying, I can track your scent. My nose serves as my eyes as I have none. I smell my food out before I come for it at night. Lucky for me I didn't have to come for you. You came to me. It opened its mouth wide as I panicked, starting to throw myself around, trying to get out of its grasp. Hold still food, it, it boomed at me. I was somehow able to move my hands into my pocket, where miraculously I felt the pepper spray that didn't fall out of my pocket. I acted quickly as I got closer to the thing's mouth and pulled out the pepper spray and sprayed it into its face. It shrieked as it dropped me, crying and holding its face. I got up quickly and ran towards the middle entrance where the creature came from. I ran as fast as I could, hearing the creature give chase behind me. I ran until I somehow found the entrance to the cave. I saw light illuminating from the entrance as I ran with all my might into the day. I kept running even after I was out of the cave. I ran and never looked back. I was able to somehow navigate my way through the forest to the cabin. I gave a sigh of relief once I saw the cabin and stopped running. I looked behind me now, expecting the thing to be right behind me, ready to strike. Nothing was there. I walked back to the cabin out of breath. When I opened the door, my mom ran towards me, embracing me as she cried. Where have you been? I called the police and they couldn't find you. I thought I lost you. I didn't say anything. I was tired and hungry, but worse of all, I was terrified knowing that more of those things were out there waiting for me. We moved shortly after that to Chicago and moved in with my aunt. I grew up normally and made new friends in Chicago, even got a new best friend named Kyle. I never forgot about James, though. He was my first best friend who was my first best friend who had my back and died in the hands of a monster. The thought of that thing still haunts me now. I tried telling my mom what happened many times, but I couldn't. I knew she still wouldn't believe me. What scares me the most is knowing there are still more of those things out there hunting in the shadows. I write this story to tell everyone, to warn everyone about these things. They hunt for children, feasting on them. Be careful near the woods. You never know what lurks in the shadows of the trees. Please don't ever go into the woods at night. They are watching and waiting for you. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.